Well, welcome to the second Sunday of Advent. As most of you know, there are four Sundays in Advent. The themes vary depending on who you ask, but um, probably the most common expressions of themes for the four weeks of Advent, the four Sundays of Advent, are the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. I've preached on these themes many different times over the years, but it seems like what has has especially been on my heart this year is just just the awareness that in perhaps in our broader church culture of, of how so often these four themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love, are are, are treated simply as, as nice gifts that are part of a sweet Christmas story. Some of you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> they are nice gifts, aren't they? Hope and peace and joy and love. They just sound nice. And isn't it nice to come to church and just feel nice? You kind of sense something coming, right? Well, for example, hope we looked at last week. So often in our broader Christian culture, hope, hope often has more to do with looking forward to reliving all the nostalgia of our Christmas Day traditions and trappings than anything else. We talk about hope at Christmas time, and it's, it's a lot of looking forward to things. But I want to suggest that in contrast to that, in contrast to, to hope, which is little more than a weak wishing for days to pass more quickly or for there to be snow, but not too much snow on Christmas Day. In contrast to hope is what I would call a weak wishing for things to somehow be nice The message of Advent boldly proclaims to a world that is lost in darkness and despair that there is a new and everlasting hope in the form of a child unlike any other who was born into the world. And this hope says that through the birth of that baby, we have reason to believe that the God who knows, the God who understands, the God who cares, the God who reveals enough to us, And the God who comes near to us in the midst of our struggles is a God whom we can fully trust in spite of the circumstances around us. That might be a nice nice statement, but it's it's not a weak nice. It's a strong nice. It's a strong hope that says God is and God knows, God understands, God cares. God will reveal and has revealed enough. We may not feel it's enough. We'd like to know more of why and when. But God has told us enough to give us something to hold on to. And God has come near to us through the person of his son. God is near us in the midst of whatever life brings. And that's a strong message of hope that we need to proclaim, not just at Christmas. We need to live not just at Christmas, but throughout the year. Likewise with peace, that's today's theme. Too often the idea of peace surrounding Christmas simply is a thought that warms our hearts with images of silent starry nights and chestnuts roasting by an open fire. And I love starry nights. I love the fireplace. I've never roasted chestnuts over an open fire. But boy, it sounds nice, doesn't it? I like the song. But friends, let me break it to you. The word did not become flesh so that soothing melodies and images on greeting cards can make us feel good inside. Christ came for more than that. He came because the world was and is at war. 
people at war with God, people at war with each other, people at war with themselves. We don't need more peaceful melodies and images. We need to wage war against all these wars. Maybe we could put that a different way. We need to wage peace. Say, wow, that sounds kind of strange. Why? I didn't come up with that expression, but it seems to fit. I thought of using the word promote peace. It just didn't seem strong enough. We need to wage peace like the world wages war. I want to make some suggestions coming back to those three areas of of being at war with God, at war with each other, and at war within ourselves. So first, we need to wage peace where people are at war with God, whether through human pride that claims we can know better or do better on our own or through ignorance of who God really is and what God wants for us. So I'm going to give some examples. These are not these are not intended to be exhaustive, but just suggestive. And in that broad category of of a, of a world that, that is at war with God. Maybe not actively, maybe not aggressively, maybe just passive-aggressively. You know that term. Are we ever passive-aggressive with God? I'm sure we are. So some various categories under that umbrella. Instead of seeking to disprove the existence of God or denying our need of God and calling it enlightenment, waging peace in terms of our relationship with God looks more like seeking to be humble ourselves and turn to the God who is and whose wisdom is the true path of life. And scripture says the fool is the one who has said in his heart there is no God. In Psalm 2, it talks about why are the nations in uproar against God? The peoples have gathered together and they're saying, oh, we want to throw off God's authority. We We don't need God anymore. I'm paraphrasing. The next verse says what? He who sits in the heaven shall laugh. Not that God is making fun of us, maybe laughing at the thought of the creature saying, I don't need the creator. I believe there's a part of God that also weeps even as he laughs at our arrogance, at our pride, at our enmity with him, at, at, our, at our choice to be at war. Another suggestion, instead of seeking to create our own version of God to justify our attitudes and actions in relation to God and others, Instead, seek to know the God who is and who is made known in Jesus. Maybe that's one of the passive-aggressive ways that we're at war with God. We create God in our own image or our own version of God. I think God is this because this is how I want to be, and I want to feel like I'm somehow in harmony. But there's a sense in which that perpetuates the distance. It it doesn't bring the peace that Christ came to bring to help us know God, the God who is, who is made known in Jesus. Instead of seeking to be good enough on our own, we should seek to humble ourselves and, and live in the grip of God's grace. And let God's grace transform us. 
sometimes the other side of that equation. It's not, a, it's not our pride and arrogance that we can make it on our own. Sometimes it's just the opposite. It's, it's being so, so imprisoned by our, our sense of, of failure, or inadequacy, or worthlessness. But instead of living our lives seeking ways to numb those feelings of failure and inadequacy and worthlessness, rather seek the truth of the God who is, who came near in Jesus to give us worth, to forgive our past, to make us new. The God who in Christ, as we sang about earlier, came our sins and griefs to bear. These are all ways that we can wage peace, both within ourselves and then to invite others also to to reach out and accept the peace that God offers, peace with him. That's where it starts. We certainly don't need any convincing of the need to wage peace where people are at war with each other. Whether as nations, groups with different political ideologies, various different people groups, whether based on race or ethnicity, based on religious beliefs, people at war with each other stemming from just the hurts of personal relationships, Under that broad umbrella, what might it look like to wage a campaign of peace in our own lives and to invite others along? Instead of seeking to prove fault, guilt, blame, or wrong, we don't do that, do we? What about seeking solutions? Interesting how sometimes we don't even really want solutions. (laughs) We just want to feel good about someone else being responsible for the angst we're feeling. I mean, we're funny that way. We want to make them pay somehow, hold them accountable. We We want to prove fault and guilt and blame or wrong rather than saying, how can we... How can we work this out? Instead of seeking to judge character and intention, what would it look like if we would would seek understanding rather than assuming? Assuming the character, assuming the intentions, assuming we know the whole story. Instead of seeking to be better than, what might it look like if we sought to extend grace to others? Instead of seeking to elevate ourselves by putting or pushing others down, waging peace could be seeking to lift others up, regardless of the cost to us. Instead of seeking to possess what others have, What might it look like if we sought to share what we have with others? Just some of the ways that we don't settle for a a weak, I want to feel good peace. But we become active and even aggressive, assertive, not in the sense of pushing myself, but in the sense of making this a priority where we would wage peace in the world. In our deacon's meeting early this morning, Joyce led us to a song, a familiar song. Uh, Kathy Tricoli, I believe, is the one who first made this popular. Carry your candle, go light your world. That's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about waging peace. We're talking about where can we make a difference? Where can we tilt the scales in the side of peace? Peace with God, peace with one another. What behaviors, what attitudes could start within my own heart and could change my relationships? And then maybe could invite others to follow. The third category, not only peace with God, peace with one another, but we need a campaign for peace 
where people are at war within ourselves. It shows up in different ways. I've just named a few. Instead of seeking more, say more what? No, just more. I mean, that's part of the war within us. Is we're not at peace because, because there's this sense of, of, of needing more. Instead of seeking more, to seek contentment. That's a way to wage peace. Instead of seeking more ways to be plugged in, tuned in, busy, entertained, and stimulated, what would it be like to seek to be, I'm going to use the term at home. I'm not talking about a location. I'm talking about feeling at home. To seek to feel at home in the still and quiet. You know how quickly we become uncomfortable and quiet. You were here last week for Donna's children's story, talking about hope and relating it to waiting and having a present and inviting the not-so-young kids who uh, came up for the story last week um, to wait one minute before opening that present. You know how long a minute is? It's even longer when you're sitting in silence. We're not very at home in the still and the quiet. What does that do? What would that do to, to begin to plant see, peace, seeds of peace in our own spirit and in the spirit of others to, to take some of these ideas and, and to look for ways, actively look for ways to to be more at peace within ourselves. I came across this quote on Facebook this week. Didn't say who it was from. It was just a page out of a book. You couldn't see any part of the book. And it was like, wow, who? So I picked out just one phrase, thinking maybe someone else has quoted it and I'll find out where it came from. And that's all it took. I don't know anything about Matt Haig. I had to look him up, an English novelist and journalist who wrote several books. The book this came from is called Reasons to Stay Alive. I don't even know much about the book, but as I read it, I thought about, I thought about this idea of peace within ourselves. He writes, the world is increasingly designed to depress us. Well, that gets your attention. Happiness isn't very good for the economy. If we were happy with what we had, why would we need more? How do you sell an anti-aging moisturizer? You make someone worry about aging. How do you get people to vote for a particular, for a political party? You make them worry about immigration. How do you get them to buy insurance? You make them worry about everything. How do you get them to have plastic surgery? By highlighting their physical flaws. How do you get them to watch a TV show? By making them Worry about missing out. How do you get them to buy a new smartphone? By making them feel like they're being left behind. To be calm becomes a kind of revolutionary act. Boy, that almost sounds revolution. Maybe I'm not so far off target after all using the term wage peace. Let me say that again. To be calm becomes a kind of revolutionary act. To be happy with your own non-upgraded existence. To be comfortable with our messy human selves would not be good for business. I'm going to say that one line again. That's the one I searched for. And that led me to the quote. Find where it is. There it is. To be calm becomes a kind of revolutionary act. I want to encourage us to seek to be at home with stillness and with quiet.
the hymns that we've sung this morning. Spoke of things like captivity, exile, envy, strife, quarrels, seem to be the opposite of peace. But they call us to a time when, when peace shall fling its ancient splendors in the language of it came upon a midnight still. Fling those ancient splendors over all the earth and the, the whole world would then sing back a song that those heavenly angels sang, peace on earth, goodwill to men. I want to take us just for a few moments to Romans 12. This is the passage that Kevin read from before our offering that talked about different gifts and how we should use those gifts well for for the glory of God and the good of those around us. In that passage, what comes before that section, what comes after? There's a lot there that talks talks about living in peace. The section that comes before it talks about understanding that that we need each other. We're all part of one body. We have different gifts. And so there's a sense of promoting peace even there. There's no no reason to be in in conflict with each other. No reason to be be trying to find who's better, who can do. Everyone's needed. Everyone has gifts that contribute to the body. And so just that call to appreciate and value each other is a call to peace and and of course, it lists, lists the gifts. But then, then immediately after those gifts, gifts are listed, it talks about something which, which transcends our differences, if you will. So we could say Paul is writing in that passage that God has given us different gifts. We have differences and we can celebrate those differences. We can appreciate those differences. And, and each one should work and serve and live out of those differences, the things they've been given, use those to serve and bless. But then comes a section that transcends those differences, that is, is a calling for each one of us. And I just want to read this passage as it goes on. And as I read this, think about, think about the theme of peace. And think about peace not simply being a, a weak a weak sense of, of everything is nice. Think of peace as being something that takes work, something that takes us to be active in seeking to go against the, cor- the normal course, to, to swim upstream, if you will, that takes effort, that takes work to bring change in our world. Beginning with verse 9, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. These are strong words, aren't they? Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Say, okay, that doesn't sound too difficult yet. But can you see where even even those actions of being attentive to other people and to their needs, be ready to welcome people into our space, those are all things that build peace, that break down conflict between people. But now it gets harder. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. 
Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. That's the way of peace. Perhaps no one has said it more succinctly, more powerfully than is said in the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. We sing this, but here it is in the form of the prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Wherever there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. Not so much seek to be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May we be God's instruments of peace in this world.